Super. We'd well, like to welcome everyone to our uh, evening sessions, our seven o'clock session on resilience with Greg Mater. Greg is the president of Open Source Integrators. He founded the company 10 years ago and has grown it to the point where the company earned uh, the Odoo Best Partner North America Awards in 2013, 2019, and 2020. Uh, has assembled a team that includes, of course, two of the vice presidents of the Odoo Community Association, and the company is a platinum sponsor of the OCA. So we look forward to hearing Greg's message on these trying times and how we all in our businesses can make our businesses more resilient and, and grow amid the, uh, amid the headwinds that we face. Over to you, Mr. Mater. Uh, thank you, Rich. Um, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. I realize we're spanning a lot of time zones here. So uh, I'd like to talk today a little bit about resilience. I'd say if there's anything we've kind of discovered this year is um, a little bit of resilience in each of us in our organizations. Um, congratulations. Uh, we just made it to level 10 of the 2020 Jumanji game. And uh, you should all be proud of yourselves for making it this far. So in my previous career, before I became an ERP integrator, I worked in uh, the mathematical modeling of social phenomenon. And it made me, uh, I've continued to study our community from that perspective, trying to understand what works and why it works and, and uh, be able to come up with some general observations about our, uh, our community and what's kind of magnificent about it. This is a little bit more general, but I think it has a lot of commonality with things we are going to see in our community. I'd like to talk about this uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, these observations are things that I think we've all seen uh, throughout this year, and I'm going to talk about them quite a bit. But let's start with complex systems are more fragile and more likely to collapse. Uh, distributed problems require distributed solutions. Relationships and self-governing institutions can be, but really are the glue that's holding stress systems together. And lastly, these are times of unparalleled innovation. And this innovation is coming to the rescue of all of us here. So let's take this first component here. Complexity is often dealt with through centralization. Uh, sometimes even resulting in complex, uh, completely centralized processes. It's not always, but it's pretty often. But what we see is from that idea of complexity, those systems are the ones that we see more stressed than uh, non-complex systems. A few things I've noticed when we've talked to our customers and, and looked around at the marketplace, uh, specialized sales channels are much more likely to be disrupted. Uh, think about this, your corner ice cream shop that expects walk-in traffic as its only source of sales is probably not doing well. Uh, customers can't necessarily get to them. However, stores that are able to come up with like a uh, different approach for sales usually are, are finding ways to continue to thrive. Uh, we do see continued supply chain disruptions, often because of distance issues and an unpredictable bullwhip effect that defies prediction. It's very hard to model uh, demand for forecasting if, if it's going up and down constantly. Uh, we're seeing monolithic software systems that aren't living up to this and are falling apart too. And an, an industry that has a great deal of complexity in the US was commercial real estate, particularly retail and office space but they would have these long inflexible leases and that's a market that's just been in terrible distress. Which gets to kind of the corollary here. Uh, distributed problems require distributed solutions. And I'd like you to think about this. How, have you noticed how quickly we've decentralized? Uh, in work, in school, and any number of things in our, our lives, we've decentralized very quickly. We've even came up with a new name for it. It's called social distancing. Uh, but from that, we've had this immediate shift 
uh, to work and educate from home. Uh, we've seen this rapid adoption of remote meetings and conferences, and this is the, a conference that's proving the success of that right now. Uh, we're able to come together virtually with a high degree of uh, cohesion and satisfaction. It's not quite the same as all meeting together in Belgium, but in its own way, this is really great. Um, we're seeing the adoption of diverse sales channels uh, with early adopters of new sales technology have done really well. And uh, I think that's something that, again, points to uh, that imaginary corner shop of ours. If they could come up with ideas for home delivery, uh, touchless pickup, omni-channel sales, whatever, those are the organizations that are doing better. Uh, another point that we're definitely seeing is this relocalization of supply chains and less dependence on fragile logistics, specifically uh, logistical supply chains that might require shipment from uh, distant countries. It, it's been very difficult to get reliable shipments and there's a rapid relocalization of, of the local providers of these. And finally, one thing that I found that was fascinating on this was uh, the diversity of research in, in the COVID vaccines. Even in COVID vaccine research, there's over 40 different candidates, all resulting from different approaches and, and different teams. And as a thought experiment, can you imagine what it would be like if there was only one vaccine research effort? And let me go a step further even. Can you imagine it being run by the U.S. government or the EU government? I believe we'd be waiting for the next 10 years for a vaccine. So this is where my old uh, career uh, gave me a way to think about this. And I, I really wanted to consider uh, what is it we're observing and, and how does our particular community fit into it. So I am going to talk a little bit about theory and uh, explain why all of us are here, why all of us are supporters of the OCA, if you've never thought about it before, and uh, we'll go from there. But there's this idea of complex adaptive systems. Uh, in this case, let's consider the OCA and the OD community at large a complex adapt adaptive system. But it's made up out of these adaptive agents that only have limited local information about the state of their part of the system. So it could be our company, it could be a different company, it could be a customer, but we all have limited local information about the state of the overall system. Complexity arises not from global planning, but as a uh, direct yet unintended consequence of each agent's search for better, more competitive adaptive strategies. So each of us, by trying to optimize our own outcomes, it turns out we can do better by working together and create these uh, complex adaptive approaches that we all benefit from. An important point I want you to really think about here, the, in, the information that sustains this organization, this complex adaptive organization, is distributed and implicit in the structure of uh, the virtual team as well. It's not explicit and centralized in the knowledge of any one agent. And I think we see that regularly, um, that we all know a little bit that we can use to bring back to the team here. So continuing on this a little bit, The distributed intelligence of these complex systems, adaptive systems, is precisely why we have higher complexity and cope with complexity better than we can with a planned centralized system. Uh, the distribution of this knowledge means there's no critical nodes, no single point of failure that can be overwhelmed as the system scales up. Each agent in the system is constantly varying its behaviors in search of an edge on the competition. And unpredictable stresses like the one we're in right now are far less likely to disrupt the complex adaptive system as a whole, uh, unlike in some sort of uh, planned system 
where it's easy to be blindsided and look in the wrong direction. So in the end, I really think this is kind of what describes why we're all here. Uh, nothing less will do for dealing with environments of high complexity. And in our world of working with ERP systems, that's about as complex as you can possibly get. So we have this distributed knowledge that is implicit in our ecology of an open source community. So let me give you an example of this. Um, and I'm going to use humanity at its best, because we, we could all use that right now. Um, without any training or institutions, why do disparate cultures come up with the same solution to save a life? And in fact, that's why I love these pictures, is these people don't know each other. Uh, they're in completely different continents. They're both trying to save a life, and they come up with the same strategy. There's no classes on this. Uh, there's no uh, how-to. But they quickly figured it out on their own, uh, and it rose to the challenge here. What I'm specifically proposing is that we are wired for this. And it's in our instincts, um, our DNA, if you will, or even more esoteric, our souls. This is literally how we're wired is to work together like this. When all else fails, our instincts do kick in. And uh, this is where I'm going to get scientific for a second again. These instincts do have some rules. Um, and I can give them to you pretty quickly. It, it's not that hard. We create these complex adaptive behaviors by working from our own interests, uh, aligning with the interests of others. We already talked about that. Number two, we really do, we can generally agree upon rules or systems that we can trust. Regardless of culture, language, or other situations, we can come up with something, some set of rules or systems that we can trust, even if we don't know or trust the individuals. And three, these simple institutions are characterized by having limited scopes and an emphasis on reputation when it comes to choosing leadership. So the people, as opposed to many systems where sometimes it feels like the worst get to the top, and these sort of self-governing institutions Generally, by affirmation, we're picking the leaders and, and teammates that we like and admire and aspire to work with. It turns out all of this behavior that I'm talking about is very resilient. In studying how we really work, we really do act this way. As fun as Mad Max or other apocalyptic stories uh, are, and they are fun, we all like to watch a good zombie movie, that doesn't really reflect us. Uh, we're, we're wired to self-organize and solve problems together. And, and through that, that's one of our big sources of resilience. So let's get to the software part. I can hear it already. Greg, let's talk software. Yes, absolutely. Let's focus on the open source movement. I believe a big part of what we're seeing is a, a huge amount of innovation that's only possible in this ecosystem that I'm talking about. So let's study this a little bit. Uh, Northbridge and Black Duck Software do a yearly survey um, talking to as many CIOs as possible about the adoption of software it's specifically open source software. It turns out this is the best CIO survey uh, of software patterns that I can find out there. And through this survey, uh, we found out some insights as to why CIOs would choose an open source solution. And let's, this is rank ordered. So it's the quality, the freedom from vendor lock-in, the competitive features and technical capabilities, the ability to customize and fit, and, and number five is total cost of ownership. I realize that might be a surprise. Often we think that's, we believe, we hear uh, from others that that's the appeal of open source software is that it's cheap or free. That's actually not the leading driver. 
it, it's the other drivers first. So what can we learn from that? That uh, developers, CIOs, CTOs are looking to create or extend a competitive advantage, and that that's often coming through the grassroots, uh, through individuals within an enterprise or organization. They're the ones that stumble upon Odoo or another open source solution, uh, make something that works, get some leadership buy-in, and from there there's investments. There's often a, a champion that has done their homework and experimentation. We talked about this a moment ago, but cost is less important than speed and flexibility. And you can think again about these individual agents in a complex adaptive system, each trying to find uh, that optimization for their own benefits uh, they are trying to go faster, and that is the speed and flexibility that we're mentioning here. There is this idea as well that I think we can see of global collaboration, and again, that's why we're here today. There's the ability to access good ideas from everywhere. And it turns out, even from competitors, or I'll, I'll have it in quotes, frenemies, uh, we're able to maybe jointly work on something together that's not... Uh, that's more important to us than any competitive advantage it might give to the other team, too. From this, we can see in the current period we're at, the business of open source software is growing up and demonstrating resilience. Uh, there's a widespread adoption of the software leading to a widespread adoption or widespread support of businesses involved in it. There's over a fascinating number uh, from my friend Joseph Jacks, who's, who studies this intently, is there's over 40 open source companies that are now earning over $100 million a year. So the community, uh, again, through pursuing their own interests here, has created industries that are well-respected, well-regarded, and, and uh, finding investment capital and um, a, a sustaining a long-term course. So let's look at GitHub for a second, because I think this kind of paints the picture back to decentralization. What we can actually see as we're talking about this is the development of new software, and in fact, whether it's open or closed, is decentralized. And you can see in particular the rate of acceleration internationally is extremely high uh, for this sort of collaborative development, this decentralized development. Uh, I, I think that's fascinating. I think that that shows that um, um, there's room for everybody uh, specifically based on a meritocratic approach. Whoever has the best ideas, regardless of where they're at, finds success. So the conclusions we can draw from all of this are a couple of things that are pretty simple. Uh, open source software is resilient, and Odoo is resilient, and our community is resilient. But it does, it's resilient because of a couple of these things, going back to it. It is this uh, idea that the best ideas will win out, regardless of where they're coming from, and that there is decentralized problem solving that scales globally. And with that, we're, we're going back to this slide. We have the idea that these decent, we're making the pool of decentralized agents, these simple self-organized local teams bigger and bigger, and that's going to drive our complex adaptive uh, circle to be bigger as well. Um, eventually, there will be, there's always going to be equilibriums as this balance is achieved. And this, um, the system theorists have a name for it. It's uh, epiphenomenon, this idea that we will have an equilibrium that's not predictable from knowing the rules at the lower level but only at the levels above it. So, one last data point. 
I look at our own organization, and there's a couple of things that come out of this based on, again, using the open source approach and everything I just talked about. So let's make it real world. A fascinating thing I've kept track of and certainly worried about a great deal, every one of our customers is surviving, and, and for the most part, thriving. Some of our customers have released new products or uh, increased sales by adapting quickly. All of them have, have survived, and many of them are doing very, very well. We do think ODU's freedom and flexibility has been a key reason. We've been able to respond and respond to their needs and change the system quickly to respond to these new conditions. So thank you. Um, what questions do you have for me? So far, Greg, we don't have any in the chat room or in Discord. Does anyone have uh, anything they'd like to post in either this Q&A, this chat, or in Discord? And we'll get those questions to Greg. Fascinating, though. Great uh, overview, kind of philosoph philosophical in terms of thought leadership with also some practical takeaways. So thank you. I think everybody's enjoying supper in Europe. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're having drinks. It's happy hour in Thank Belgium. It. Happy hour in Brussels. We have about 10 minutes left. Do you have any other uh, thoughts that you, you know, not, not necessarily on the slides, but anything off topic? Uh, I, I was at a customer site yesterday and uh, again, they adapted very quickly to the changing conditions. They're one of the companies I can think of where their sales have actually increased, even though there's a lockdown. Um, and what I noticed about that was in talking with their CEO, he, they'd been around for years and he's still considering themselves a startup and they're still innovating and trying to create uh, better, more resilient business processes every day. Um, I think that's a big part of it. If I'm being is we can never, we as leaders in our own organizations or advising others really can't be complacent. We have to expect that times are going to change and that people are going to be um, constantly challenged to adapt to whatever the new conditions are going to be. So they, they were doing a great job at that. And I, I would say I've seen that at every customer I've talked to. It seems too. Also, when you look at the stock prices of a lot of large cap companies, that they the ones that have, um, yeah. And Dan is pointing, posting in here. If anyone can write their questions in the chat, please. But the the large cap, a lot of the large cap companies that have seen their stocks resilient among the uh, different challenges from the COVID uh, virus are companies that have been innovating for years and uh, continue to bring new products to market. Uh, also, have cash reserves to be able to withstand some of these challenges. And so there's a lot of lessons to be learned, even for those of us that are working with small or emerging growth or mid-market companies. Yes, absolutely. I, I think we're going to see more automation um, across the board for every business in, in order to reduce risk probably more than anything else. Yes, Rich. Have you, I was just wondering if you've seen any patterns or trends among some of the open source integrators clients that have been using Odoo that uh, Odoo itself has been able to help them spot some market opportunities or develop new products and, and take those to market and do some research that allowed them to launch some of these new products or these new initiatives that they would not have been able to do had they dealt with, uh, you know, siloed applications, a lot of manual processes, or some closed software solutions such as Sage, NetSuite, Microsoft Dynamics, Oracle, SAP, has the freedom and flexibility of Odoo been an advantage in their resiliency that you, you know, any use cases that sure. you want to share with us? I, I think that's a great question. Um, the integration and openness of Odoo, when it, let's pick a, one important marketplace, but with regard to manufacturing and direct sales, uh, yes, we've seen customers do very deep analysis of the changes in their sales patterns. And by looking at their inventory of raw materials, be able to switch their manufacturing around quickly to be able to uh, meet these new demands. So you could imagine uh, companies that might be selling personal protective equipment, uh, first of all, had to look at, at they, they first discovered there was a demand, and they could see that through the change in their patterns. But from there, they could look at the raw materials they have and repurpose in order to 
uh, quickly shift to new operations and new products in that, that marketplace. Um, it, it doesn't, we can have great plans for, uh, gee, we want to get into this market tomorrow, but if you don't have the inventory and manufacturing and supply chain to support it, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, with Odoo, that openness allows us to get inside the data and do better analysis for, for what customers are actually purchasing and what their needs are and be able to do a little bit better predictive uh, analysis leading to product development and, and manufacturing more quickly than, the com than competitive software solutions. As the COVID virus started, it of course started in China and then moved very rapidly to all over the world. Uh, also had some large outbreaks in Europe before it reached North and South America. Uh, do you, have you seen any impacts in terms of, you mentioned supply chain of which China is a, is a large vendor for many of the companies using Odoo for manufacturing. Has there been uh, usage of Odoo that has helped companies to be more resilient in terms of inventory planning to avoid supply chain disruptions pushing back maybe their, their customers through the CRM uh, in terms of prioritizing them so that their, their A customers get the product they need first, the B customer second, the C customers third type of thing? Or do you have any use cases where Odoo has really helped uh, in inventory management? Yeah, one of our customers that's released two products since the COVID crisis definitely had to, they do their manufacturing here in the United States, but ship globally. And they definitely had to think about their allocation strategy of what they could ship to different customers, uh, actually upstream. So to their distributors and international markets, they did have to think about what was, um, what they could forecast when based on disruptions and them being able to ship as well as trying to meet the demand of the local, uh, local market first. And, Odoo was instrumental in them being able to perform that analysis and weigh out the uh, weigh out the shipping challenges and and uh, manufacturing uh, challenges to reprioritize and address the local market first while not forgetting about the international market as well. So yes, absolutely. Interesting. Thank you for that. One question too, you know, part of the COVID response is that people have not been able to go to restaurants or to go shopping in their traditional shopping malls or retail stores. And obviously the, the virus has spread through touch. In some cases it, it lives for, you know, many hours on, on contact of surfaces. Have you seen where Odoo uh, has been able to in, improve through e-commerce uh, some of these businesses, but also at the point of sale, of course, Odoo has a point of sale module and there are uh, retail environments such as Amazon Go or uh, others where you are able to walk in and have touchless point of sale, touchless merchant, you know, the, the consumer is able to self-serve and grab merchandise they need and leave, uh, you know, and also the, that the, as part of that, then, then uh, Odoo, has there been any kind of analytics or artificial intelligence or Odoo being able to support a, a closer relationship with the customer because of e-commerce or because of touchless point of sale and some of those things, are you seeing any UK use cases that Odoo supports in that arena? I, I think we're at the infancy of that, but that's definitely where the future is going. Um, I think we're definitely seeing um, the companies that can take an omni-channel sales approach and give a customer a great experience no matter how that customer stumbled upon them, whether it was through a marketplace, e-commerce, brick and mortar, or whatever. Those customers, uh, scenarios are leading to much better outcomes. So uh, to your big point of, is this leading towards uh, some sort of touchless POS uh, on a global scale for retail? I think absolutely. I think Amazon Go is pointing in the right direction. And I think as a community, this is something that we should be considering is how do we support these different ways of buying uh, that might be come in, grab and go, uh, delivery or various other um, methods of, of purchase and fulfillment. So I think you're absolutely right to bring that up. It, it's, we're just the beginnings of it, but this is going to be an area of uh, exploration, I think, for all of us coming up. What do you see in terms of the community that uh, trends that the community should be involved in development? Have you, have you had any idea on certain modules or certain functionality that you wish the community 
would do would do and and that you think would help in terms of these businesses being more resilient sure i think if i could think of anything the community could work together on uh that would be a specific thing that benefits all of us it's actually the topic you just brought up and i saw that there were previous uh sessions on it within uh oca days but it's, it is pos i think this is an area where um we could work together and build something that does support these new purchasing approaches and uh, leads us towards a, a better solution for our customers. So that's, that's a great question. I think we're out of time here. Out of time. We're right at the bottom of the hour. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to set this up for Wolfgang Hall and Corrado Pagliani are going to speak next about business intelligence. And uh, we'll just take a few minute break and they'll be back here at 35 minutes after the hour. So I want to thank Greg Mater again, very insightful, very interesting uh, discussion, very wide ranging. Wish we had, uh, it looked like RWGRO had a question, raised his hand, his or her hand, but didn't have a chance to get that Wait, actually in the chat I'll, window. I'll be over in Discord and they can grab me there. So thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Bye.